quorum being present, this town meeting is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. One quick announcement. The town clerk has asked me to advise town meeting members that uh, they are not, not allowed to gather signatures within the town meeting hall, but you can do it out in the, um, in the lobby. And I guess that means me too. Um, business under Article 9. Mr. Hansen makes the motion. Is there a second? Second? Mr. Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Hansen, Precinct 7, and the Chairman of the Community Planning and Development Commission. Good evening, town meeting members and guests. Uh, the third article sponsored by the CPDC for the subsequent town meeting, Article 9, is an amendment to Section 10.3 of the Zoning Bylaw entitled Aquifer Protection District. So back when the Zoning Advisory Committee was leading the charge on improving uh, the Zoning Bylaw, a number of public forums were held. A common theme throughout many of these forums with, was with regards to the Aquifer Protection District, the rationale behind it and the restrictions that are in place because of it. What is before you today is the culmination of a lot of work that has resulted in a simplified bylaw with some lessening of district restrictions. Under the leadership of the CPDC, input from Town Council, the Conservation Commission, Planning and Engineering Departments, and Mass DEP was incorporated. We learned that our bylaw in its current state is more rigorous than required by state law. We have addressed that in our proposal. But before we get too far, let's start with the basics about the Aquifer Protection District. There are a lot of questions about the district, its purpose, location, why we need it. The first few slides of this presentation are meant to provide a foundation uh, of the Aquifer Protection District. So let's start at the beginning. What is an aquifer? Uh, an aquifer is a geologic formation composed of rock, sand, or gravel that contains significant amounts of potentially recoverable water. What is the Aquifer Protection District? Uh, it's the land that provides groundwater recharge or absorption to an existing or planned public drinking water supply well. So why do we need an Aquifer Protection District regulated by zoning? Well, simply put, it's required as part of the state's drinking water regulations and water withdrawal permit program. Any city or town in Massachusetts that has a well or a series of wells has to meet this regulation. Since the town of Reading has wells, we are required by Mass Department of Environmental Protection to protect these wells as a potential source of drinking water. Reading, well, excuse me, Reading handles the Aquifer Protection District as an overlay district which regulates new construction and additions to existing buildings. Mass DEP requires a protection district for the following reasons, which are up on the screen. Uh, to promote the health, safety, and general welfare of the community by ensuring adequate drinking water. Preserve and protect existing and potential sources of drinking water supplies. Conserve natural resources of the town and prevent harm to the environment. So why is Reading required to protect these wells if we no longer use them for drinking water? Well, getting down to the brass tacks, there's a DEP administrative consent order requiring the protection of these wells as an emergency water supply. So now, that we, so now we know what it is and why we protect it. Next question, how was the Aquifer Protection District identified? It was identified as part of a study by Weston and Sampson engineers entitled 100 Acre Well Field Zone 2 Study dated July 1996. The Mass DEP approved the bylaw and map in December 2002. And the point of me bringing this up is it just, it's really not an arbitrary boundary. It's one that has been well identified. So this map shows the location of the district, which covers multiple towns, including Reading, which is up here, 
We got Wilmington over here and then Burlington down here. Um, it covers the northwest portion of Reading right up here. You've got some landmarks of Meadowbrook Golf Club, Birch Meadow, and Reading downtown. So it covers the northwest corner of the town. So let's now move into some details regarding the proposed changes to the Aquifer Protection District bylaw. A number of updates have been proposed to the definitions currently located in this section. First, we moved all the definitions to section 2.0 the to the, of the zoning bylaw entitled definitions. This was a stated goal of the zoning bylaw rewrite to centralize de definitions as much as possible. This moves us in that direction. We developed new definitions based on feedback from the building inspector and town council, such as underground storage tank, landfill, and open dump. We updated definitions, again, based on feedback, including impervious surface and earth removal. And then lastly, we removed definitions that are not necessary, as they're already covered under the state statute or are already in other sections of the bylaw. Terms like mining, potential drinking water, I'm sorry, potential drinking water sources zone two, recharge area, and toxic and hazardous materials. We moved the scope and authority to a new section 10.3.1 to make it more pronounced and to provide a firmer starting point to this section of the bylaw. And as a means of simplification, we deleted boundary disputes as this is already being addressed via existing processes. We did an extensive review of the impervious area threshold section, and this is where a lot of the feedback from town citizens revolved and where discussions with the, DE, with the mass DEP primarily focused. So we did not change any of the thresholds. However, we did update the language so the thresholds only apply to the portions of the lot in the district versus the entire lot and we removed the requirement for the artificial recharge system for residential units. Rather, residences can use natural recharge designs like rain gardens and swales. Another means of simplification, we removed subsection 10.3.7, non-conforming uses and structures, and section 10.3.9, violation notices, as these are already being covered by section 7.0 of the bylaw. Non-conforming, I'm sorry, non-conforming, and Section 4.2 enforcement, respectively. Thank you for your time this evening. CPDC report, Mr. Safina. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. On June 29th, 2015, the CPDC convened to hold a public hearing on the proposed Article 9. Public hearing was held to provide an opportunity for comment and to determine whether the provisions of the amended zoning bylaw shall be adopted by the town. All documents were made available on the town website and at town hall. June 29th, 2015, CPDC public hearing was opened at approximately 745. A presentation was made by the planning staff and discussion followed. All comments received at the hearing were included as part of the record of the hearing. Public hearing was closed that same evening Sub subsequent review ensued by DEP. The CPDC postponed their vote on the draft amendment to allow for DEP comments. On August 24th, 2015, the CPDC voted 500 to recommend Article 9 to town meeting. Thank you. Bylaw Committee report. Mr. Crook. Stephen Crook, Chair of the Bylaw Committee. At our meeting of October 13th, the Bylaw Committee voted 500 to recommend this article to town meeting. Is there further discussion? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, under 10.3.3.1, permitted uses.
3.1, Bob. 10.3.3.1. And I, I, I can't read from here anyways. It's on page 27 on, my hand, on the uh, Warren article here. Under permitted uses. I think you had it. There it is. Yep. Okay. Is that is that right? Well, I'm I'm reading from page 27, so I'll go over that. The small uh, the letter B, uh, permitted uses outdoor recreation, natural study, boating, fishing, and hunting where otherwise legally permitted. I think the word otherwise in there contradicts the uh, permitted uses. To me. And. Maybe town council can read it different than I do, because it's legally permitted and it says otherwise legally permitted. Can we drop the word out of there and just leave it uh, legally permitted? This is dangerous. Two two attorneys talking. This me, Aries. <laughs> I, I hope she's smarter than you are. Go ahead. So do I. <laughs> okay. So, um, what the, I'll tell you what this is supposed to mean, and then we can decide whether we want to keep it. Um, where otherwise legally permitted is intended to mean, assuming that you have all the other things that you need uh, in place, like um, a fishing license, a hunting license, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I'm happy to strike where otherwise legally permitted, if you yeah. like, um, uh, I, I, or I'm I think, happy to keep it there. Uh, no, I, I'd like to strike it. I just think it's confusing, quite frankly. It seems, to me, it reads contradictory, because I know that 90% of the law is. <laughs> well, maybe it's only 85%. <laughs> but okay. the, um, uh, so this is the way it is in the DEP model. Yeah. And, um, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to strike the words where yeah. otherwise legally permitted if that's yeah. what you'd like to propose. No, just leave, leave the word, just take out the word otherwise. I think the rest of it's all right. This is where legally permitted. Obviously, if you got all your licenses and everything else, you are legally permitted. You don't want to strike the whole four words, huh? Well, what, what would be the difference? Ask a young lady. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, she told me to stick, but stick to the four words and keep them all. Yeah. So uh, I was being more generous to you than she was. Yeah. The, um, um, uh, fine. If you want to strike the word otherwise, I guess I have no objection. Okay. I'll, I'll make, make a motion. motion to strike the word otherwise. Thank okay. you. Is there a second to that motion? Otherwise. Okay. We'll now discuss the motion to strike the word otherwise. Is there further discussion on that subject? None appearing. We're ready for the vote. All those in favor of the amendment to strike the word otherwise, please raise your hand. And opposed? And the motion carries. We're now back to the main motion as amended. Further discussion? Yes, uh, Ms. Whiting? Carolyn Whiting, Precinct 7. And I'm a little concerned because we used to have a clause or, or, or a section 10.3.7 um, non-conforming uses and structures that um, says non-conforming uses and structures which were lawfully existing, begun, or in receipt of a building or special permit prior to the first publication of notice, et cetera, um, are still going to be allowed. And I'm concerned that if, for example, I have propane tanks in my yard that are just sitting on a concrete, you know, surface, but they're not contained. I'm, not, I'm just concerned I'm going to have to spend a lot of money to comply with this new 
if I'm in the protection district, which I, I assume I probably am since I'm north of the water tower. Okay, so the answer to the question is uh, we, uh, we don't need to repeat here what is generally true for all zoning, uh, namely mm -hmm. that nonconforming uses are always protected. And that appears, I'm told, in section 8.7. No? Oh, okay. Nonconforming uses and structures. So it's 1037. Oh, okay. It applies to all zoning provisions, not just this one. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, right on the aisle. Thanks. Dimitri Sekris, uh, Precinct 4. So the gentleman who presented this did a great job, but I have a question. Perhaps he'll have to answer it. Um, from a practical point of view, what I'm concerned about is, similarly to recent changes in zoning that resulted in a house that sort of wedged into a really small lot on South Street on the other side of Main Street, which I think surprised a lot of people, I wonder if there are unintended consequences here that, I guess I'm concerned about that, specifically about um, rain gardens, swales, etc. I'm a big fan and I think that's great. And if the outcome is that homeowners will use those options, then I think this, that's terrific. But I'm concerned if the general zoning is loosened up, if that means that those might be ignored and, and simply not done. And I'd like someone to respond to that, <clears throat> please. Do we have a response? Okay, Mr. Hanson will. Mr. Hanson. So yeah, it's a good, it, it's a very good point. I mean, we are intentionally uh, relaxing some of the restrictions based on a lot of the feedback that we're getting. Um, we don't anticipate these unanticipated um, fallouts that you're referencing. Uh, we do have some controls in place depending on if the building inspector does get involved. Um, but I mean the intent here really is to intentionally reduce those restrictions to make it easier on primarily the residents. Mm -hmm. That artificial recharge was a huge burden for them to have to bear because it was a lot of money, $25,000 quite often, but I, go ahead. So, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that currently, if you're in this area and you wanna do an addition, a deck or a small room, whatever, you have to put in the, the recharge system. You have to. If you're over, yeah, if you're over the threshold. So, with these changes, if you are going to do an addition and you're over the threshold, you no longer have to do anything. That's right. So well, you are encouraged to do something, but you don't have to do anything. Is that correct? No, you have to, um, you have to ensure that you have the proper recharge. You no longer have to do it through an artificial means. You don't have to in introduce okay. an artificial system. You can Great. use rain gardens and swales to control That's that runoff. That's what I needed to know. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Mon. Thank you. Jamie Mon, uh, Precinct 4. Uh, just to comment on that last question, um, not only does this have to, uh, any activity within the uh, actual protection zone have to conform with this new bylaw or the old bylaw, it also, in almost every case, has to conform with the Wetland Protection Act, which is a good thing. It gives us a double protection. So in response to the last question, whether it's an engineered system to recharge or a natural swale, still the appropriate amount of rainwater will be infiltrated into the aquifer. So um, the statement's been made several times that the requirement has been lessened. That really is not true. We're still maintaining the same level of protection. There's just more flexibility in maintaining that. 
So having said that, just two pieces of background. One, we say that this Act for Protection District bylaw is required by DEP, which is certainly correct. But also, when we switched from those active everyday use of those wells to the MWRA system, a condition, an absolute condition was we had to maintain those wells, maintain their productivity, and maintain the protection of the quality and quantity of those wells. So we have agreed to maintain an aquifer protection district when we switch to MWRA water. Um, the second point I want to raise is background. The intent of this aquifer protection district is to protect those wells, both the quantity and quality of water in the wells. However, we get a twofer because this aquifer protection district is around the Ipswich River, which is primary, probably the primary natural resource of this town. And all that it embodies with regard to flood protection, wildlife, and so on and so forth. This aquifer protection district not only protects those wells, but it protects the, the quantity and quality of the Ipswich River. So we're getting a benefit here. Um, third thing is, I'd just like to, to ask a question, and I think I know the answer, but I just want to be 100% sure. You said that DEP was involved in, in formulating this bylaw. And I want to be confident that they have looked at it and they're comfortable because we have to comply with DEP's interpretation. Okay. Mr. Meares. Before I respond, um, we, I want to introduce my associate, if you're free, who, um, so you don't have to refer to her as that young lady. Um, um, so the answer is we, we've had more than our share of conversations with DEP staff over this. They have approved every word. Thank you very much. I was confident of that. I just wanted to uh, give you a chance to shine. <laughs> now, and then finally, I'd like to propose an amendment. And that amendment has to do with section 10.3.3 point one and letter I. It's on page 23. And this amendment has to do with the, the use of impervious pavers. Impervious pavers or something are surfaces you can use other than conventional asphalt or concrete for a driveway, a patio, a sidewalk, a stoop, a uh, basketball court, or so on and so forth. And it's never been totally clear in the town how we deal with impervious pavers when we evaluate wetland protection applications as well as aquifer protection district. So my amendment is to codify the use of pe pe pervious pavers in the bylaw so that those of us that have to enforce us enforce them have clear guidance. And my proposal for the amendment is as follows. Uh, I would read land use that alters a lot such that the total amount of impervious surface on the lot within the district would not exceed 2,500 square feet or 15 percent of that portion of the lot within the district whichever is greater unless, and then after the word unless, I'd like to propose a colon, and then the number one, and, and this is no change, a system of artificial recharge or precipitation is designed with the applicable, applicable design standards established by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Stormwater Regulations and approved by the town engineer and I would like to add after the word engineer and the Conservation Commission. And then after the word is provided, I would like a semicolon or number two, and this is, is the main part of the amendment, pervious pavers 
or equivalent are used and the manufacturer's specification for infiltration are factored into the impervious surface and infiltration calculations. What this allows is to use pervious pavers and even if you exceed some of these standards, you're still allowing the appropriate amount of water to infiltrate into the groundwater. So it just provides another option and more flexibility to meet the standard that's specified by DEP. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Uh, further discussion on the proposed amendment? Ms. Herrick? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Karen Herrick, Precinct 8. I, I like this amendment, and I just wanted to offer a friendly amendment to the amendment. Um, where um, Mr. Mon has uh, itemized number two, could we put after pervious pavers or pervious pavement material? Just makes it a little bit broader, but it's I basically think, the same category. I think it's fine. The equivalent should cover that, but okay. it's okay to add that also. Thank you. Other discussion? Yes, on the edge. I'm uh, Demetra Sekris, Precinct 4. A little while ago, I was actually, <clears throat> excuse me, working on a rain garden, and I talked to someone in the town, several people in the town, about how they calculate water runoff, because we pay for it, per percentage, depending on our house. And I was told that impervious pavers, which in theory are a great idea, do not count as, sorry, as pervious pavers do not count pervious surface, if that's a word, but are in fact counted as an impervious because when pervious pavers are laid, in reality, they, they don't really let water move through the same way that, for instance, a rain garden. So, if this body is comfortable with um, using a manufacturer's specs on selling pervious pavers, I think that might be a mistake on this amendment. And I think that might lead to um, unintended consequences. So I'm, I'm I'm sure there are other people in this room who know more about this than I do, but that is my understanding. So if the town already answered that question to me one way, I wonder if that's how we want to go with this. I hope that's helpful. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Mr. Tuttle. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dave Tuttle of Precinct 3 and a member of the CPDC. There was a lot of discussion about uh, so-called pervious pavers and pervious pavement. It has come up uh, quite a few times in various projects, including areas that are not impacted by the Aquifer Protection District, su such as along Main Street. We deliberately and consciously eliminated them from consideration because two things, pervious uh, pavers have a short lifetime. In other words, they may perform uh, as stated when they're installed, but they very quickly, uh, certainly in New England, accumulate and change and become effectively impervious. And the so-called pervious pavement has an additional problem in that the town does not require a building permit for uh, paving work, certainly not on an existing uh, driveway or parking area, so that what was installed as pervious pavement can, without any town notice, 
uh, be replaced with standard asphalt. And the only way to control this is basically disallow them as alternatives in this particular case. Mr. Meares? I think this is going to need some wordsmithing to go forward, but in order for me to do the wordsmithing, I need to understand what the intent is. So the first part of the sentence says that these are, these are things that are permitted, land uses that alter a lot such that the total amount of impervious surface on the lot within the district would not exceed 2,500 square feet or 15% of that portion of the lot located within the district, okay, whichever is greater. And it says unless, and then if you jump down to, to what the new language, it's referring to pervious paver or pervious pavement is used. But those are things that don't count towards the 2,500 square feet anyway. So um, I'm I'm not sure what what you're attempting to carve out. The language as it appears right now, the, um, uh, the, the, the language that's proposed isn't part of, of what would be counted towards the 2,500 in the first place. So may, maybe I'm missing what your intent is. Mr. Munn. The original unless, as I understand it, provides an exception to the 15% or 2,500. That's correct. The, Pervious pavers would also provide a modification of the 15% or 2,500. For example, if your pervious pavers allowed infiltration of 50%, then instead of 10, uh, uh, 100 square feet of impervious pavers, you could have 200 square feet of pervious pavers. So it's a, a way to modify that requirement, just like the um, artificial infiltration systems are a way to modify. And I would also like to add that I, I agree with several of the commenters that the history of pervious pavers has not been stellar. But with the active enforcement of stormwater regulations, there have been great strides. And the um, and the uh, requirement for review and calculation makes sure that the, uh, the more modern and the better performing materials are used. Okay, but the, the original I before the unless allows already an unlimited amount of pervious um, <coughs> pavers. So I don't understand what, the, what you're substituting. I, I'm sorry, you're saying it allows? Unlimited, I mean, this only talks about limiting the amount of impervious surfaces. So you can have pervious surfaces to your heart's delight under I. So you, I don't know why, we're, why you need to carve anything out for impervious. For because impervious the, the, the bylaw as written is, sil is silent on pervious pavers. And the yes. interpretation, as pointed out earlier, by the 10 engineering department is that they're not allowed. And so this would allow the use of pervious pavers. The 10 historically has included areas paved with pervious pavers as impervious surface. And this would allow paving with pervious pavers and taking credit for some infiltration. So I think, then, what you're looking for is to change the definition of impervious surface so that pervious pavers don't count as impervious surface. Mr. Munn. This is, uh, th this is complicated. Pervious pavers are not 100% pervious. Based on how they're constructed, they can allow 10 percent infiltration up to 50 percent, mm -hmm. that, thus the manufacturer specification. If they allow 50 percent, 
then the area covered by pervious pavers, only, only half of that is impervious. If they're only 10% pervious, then 90% of them are impervious. Okay. I'm going to have to check with the brains of the operation. While we're checking that, I think Mr. Hecht had a question on the main motion. Yes, let's, we'll go back to that just to, because I know you were pretty patient back there. Bill Heck, Precinct 8, uh, former member of the Conservation Commission, it was pointed out to me that I believe in both the old bylaw and the new bylaw there is an error. Uh, if you look at Article 9, Section 1, it says allows precipitation of surface water runoff to, patris to penetrate the soil. I believe it should be or, because precipitation or surface runoff. I don't think it makes any difference, uh, obviously, if there's precipitation. It may result in surface runoff, it may not. I believe the word or is what's absolutely necessary there, because you're talking about two different phenomena rain, precipitation, and surface runoff, which is a different phenomenon. So I believe both in the original bylaw and in this one there's an of when there should be an or. That's my only question. Do we have a response to that, Mr. Hansen? Yeah, I, I would actually agree with that, and I would propose that amendment, a friendly amendment. Make of or. I'm sure we've got it. We have it. Okay, okay, so, so the, is there any objection to accepting that as part of the main motion? None appearing. Okay, are we back to uh, the amendment? <laughs> the proposed amendment? So, turns Three out hours. that the definition that we have here is exactly the definition that DEP uses in its regulation. So, um, that's what, it's not like we ever make anything up if we, if we can avoid it. Um, so you've posed an interesting question that the law does not, has, as far as I can tell, is not contemplated. The law imagines that things are either pervious or impervious. So the definition of impervious says does not allow precipitation or surface water runoff to penetrate directly into the soil. So if it allows it a little bit, it's no longer impervious, it's, perv it's pervious. So you're suggesting, certainly makes sense as a matter of physics, that some things are more pervious than others. They allow more, a higher percentage. So um, this poses a very interesting um, uh, dilemma for us because uh, if we, if we change the definition to accommodate that, we will not be in compliance with the DEP regulations. DEP regulations don't appear to, to acknowledge um, uh, this distinction. Maybe they should, but I, I guess I would be hesitant to m make the change that you've suggested um, without having gotten it approved by DEP. So I would suggest that the better approach here would be to, um, to leave it alone for now. And if you want to make an instructional mo motion to uh, ask the CPDC to look into, uh, in into uh, revisiting this at a future town meeting to accommodate various degrees of perviousness, um, uh, we can do it. Mr. Mon. This probably isn't the, the proper form to get into a back and forth, but believe me, I've been through these calculations many times, and the DEP regulations allow you to apply infiltration rates at various levels. If it's totally sand, you have a very high infiltration rate. If it's clay, you have a low infiltration rate. Rate. So there's a range of infiltration rates you use in the calculations. And I miss, wish Mr. Zamboris was here. He could, uh, he could explain it also. What these impervious 
or excuse me, these pervious papers are, are somewhere in that continuum. They're somewhere between sand and clay. And so you factor into the number of square feet you have in your lot in pervious pavers an infiltration rate just like you would sand, clay, rock, and so on. Mr. Mayor, okay, so the problem is is that the only thing that is limited here is impervious surfaces. So zero infiltration. If it's a little bit of infiltration, it's not prohibited at all. Uh, and it's not limited at all. You, and um, so um, uh, anything that is a little bit pervious is um, not restricted under the, the way this is written. If, that's, if, if we want to get more sophisticated and give different amounts of credit for different amounts of perv perviousness, we can do it, but we probably can't do it tonight because that'd be too complicated to undertake it. Mr. Safina. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Nick Safina, Precinct 3 and member of CPDC. I'll just add this and see if maybe it clears it up, but my understanding is that the impervious, the pervious pavers have not been discounted by engineering. They only check the calculations. And so if you come to them with a design that shows Mr. Zena, could you speak into the microphone? If, if you come to engineering with a design that has a 50% pervious rating, they'll check the calculation, and then what is impervious is what will count against you at that time. In the, my understanding is that the building department, the building inspector, has an issue with pervious pavers. Pavers, pervious pavers are an artificial recharge system. You are modifying the surface and creating something that can then recharge through it at a certain rate. And so it's allowed as long as your calculation is correct. Further discussion? Yes, right. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Nancy Toomey, Precinct 3. Um, maybe I can bring some practical aspects to this. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm against this amendment. It's not that I'm against pervious pavement. In fact, I laud the, applaud the whole bylaw because now, as opposed to in the previous bylaw, pervious pavers are allowed by the language of this bylaw. Uh, the previous bylaw did not allow them, and that is why the town was saying you cannot use them. This bylaw, if we vote for it, does allow us to use it. So Mr. Safina's re report, I'm, I happen to be an architect in town and do a lot of work in the Aquifer Protection District. We have to submit a plot plan by a uh, surveyor who does do those calculations. And it does go to the building department who looks at it, sends it to engineering for approval, and engineering looks at those calculations. And clearly, if we're using some of the pavement as pervious, we have to prove to the building department and to the engineer that that pervious pavement accounts for so much. And that's based upon what those pervious pavers allow. So I don't think that, um, that this amendment clarifies it. If it does anything, it actually makes it a lot more confusing. And uh, there are plenty of oversight by the town department, particularly the engineering department, to, uh, to make sure that those calculations are correct. And then furthermore, yes, you're right. Somebody could come and pave over that driveway and now make it pervious. However, I think that it's best to look at people in the bright side and say that they really do want to conform if they're given the opportunity. Our previous bylaw did not let them conform. So what they did was they left the patio off the drawings. And as soon as everybody left, they put the patio in. So why not let them put the patio on the drawings with pervious pavers to show that it does meet those requirements and allow that to happen? Because then it'll get done. It's not done after the fact. So thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Are we, oh yes, Ms. Schneider. Thank you, 
Mr. Moderator, Gina Snyder, Precinct 5. Um, I just wanted to get a clarification on the language says the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Stormwater Regulations. In looking that up, they do have a list of BMPs, and in the BMPs is porous pavement. Um, so I'm assuming that porous pavement is sort of automatically included in that because it references these rules. And I um, also want to, um, there are disadvantages to um, porous pavement. Uh, it's prone to, prone to clogging. So people who put it in should know that they need to maintain it properly to keep that infiltration working. Um, but could you confirm that this is incorporated because it references those regs and so there isn't a need to put a one and a two? Mr. Miaris? It is incorporated into one. I would take the position that it's that that incorporation is redundant because it's not included in the first part. But um, always, uh, I'm always happy to have belt and suspenders, so um, it's fine. So I, I think it's a little dangerous to just call out this particular BMP when there's a lot of other good ones too. So I think it's the, I think the wording is better the way it was originally. Further discussion on the amendment? Yes. <clears throat> Steve Herrick, Precinct 8. Um, I think, I, I don't know if I'm walking on a limb here because I don't have any personal experience with this, but I do have feedback from people who do have personal experience with this. And in reading the language of this, if we leave this um, amendment out, it basically says a system of artificial recharge of precipitation is designed with the applicable design standards established by the uh, Mass Department of Environmental Protection and approved by the town engineer. <clears throat> my understanding at the moment, and I could be wrong, but my understanding at the moment is that the town engineer doesn't like these and won't approve them. I, I, that's the feedback I get from people who have been in the situation. I'm negative on that. I don't like those. They don't, they don't, they don't even meet my approval. So it doesn't really matter that calculations may or may not be getting done if the position of the town engineer and the way the bylaw is written is that the town engineer can simply say, I don't like these. I'm not going to approve them. Um, so that's kind of one point I think needs to be taken into account. And I think that may be uh, something that potentially, notwithstanding the fact that I don't know if this amendment does in fact confuse things, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand this problem well enough to know that, but I think that if you don't have this in there that leaves this thing wide open to the judgment of one individual. Um, this is what I'm hearing, I'm just telling you. There's something else I want to point out uh, that to me I think is relevant, and it gets a little bit away from this amendment, and I apologize to stop me if I'm getting off point here. Um, I went back to the beginning of Article, excuse me, I went back to the beginning of Article 9. And what it says here talks about the purpose of the district to, most, to promote the health, safety, general welfare of the community by ensuring adequate quality and, drink, and quantity of drinking water to the residents and institutions of business town of Reading. That's A. B, preserve and protect the existing potential sources of drinking water supplies. And also protect the natural resources and um, contamination of the environment. Uh, we, we no longer draw our water from the aquifer. We no longer. I know North Reading does, and I know that they don't have nearly the level of restrictions in their town that we have in this town. Um, I think that something to ease the burden on the residents who live in that Remember, section Remember, we're town, talking about the amendment right I now. certainly do, and I just want to, I, I understand that, and I'm, I don't mean to go off, but I do think that hewing a tight line in this is potentially problematic for a lot of people in town. But my main point is that I think that the situation, I think that people in the audience there need to know is that the engineer has a negative view of this. and. Um, uh, I think it leaves too much wiggle room. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Andrew Harlehy, Precinct 1. Um, just more of a point of information. I appreciate Mr. Mon's amendment. I would just argue it's two amendments and not one. I'd appreciate the opportunity to vote for and the Conservation Commission and then the issue of the pervious papers. Yes, I see what you mean. We will we'll divide those. 
Did you have a comment, Mr. Harris? So you just divided it? I think so. Why? Do you, okay. do you not agree? No, it's fine. No. Um, but are you want to comment on and the Conservation Commission, or are we not on that now? We, we could talk on either one. It's still okay. all one big amendment. We're just going to vote on it in two separate pieces. Okay. So uh, I would recommend that we not include and the Conservation Commission um, because Conservation Commission would not necessarily have jurisdiction over the, uh, over everything that goes on in the Aquifer Protection District. Um, so you'd be adding an extra layer. You'd probably have to go and do something with the, with the um, wetlands bylaw to give them the extra jurisdiction. We, if you want to consider that, doing that, again, that's a project for, that we can take on if you want to instruct um, staff to uh, come back with a recommendation to a future town meeting. But as it is right now, uh, this looks like a backdoor way of expanding the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission without actually doing it. So I would suggest that that um, it's probably not a good idea to do that one either. So just to clarify what happened, we've divided the motions. We still can talk on either one, but the, um, the two separate thoughts, Remo um, putting in the words and Conservation Commission is one. We'll take a vote on that, and then the, everything else will be we'll take a vote on. Further discussion? Yes. Nick Safina, Precinct 3. So, so what happens to the or that we added up at the beginning? Uh, is that a third amendment? No, that's still part of the same thought. Part of which one of these? Oh, oh we, uh, oh, way back, we already, we already accepted that as part of the main motion. Any further discussion from people who have not spoken yet? Yes, Mr. Sylvester. Paul Sylvester, Precinct 3. Um, if I look at this and I interpret what it says, I've heard comments about a concern of what the town engineer uh, will allow. And we're trying to push the use of uh, permeable pavers or permeable surfaces, certainly. Um, but the town engineer doesn't get involved unless you've exceeded the 2,500 or 15% with an impervious surface. So if, you don't, if you're not putting in that huge impervious surface, town engineer's not involved at all. So that's one thing. And the other thing with respect to uh, Conservation Commission, one of the things that I know we're trying to do in the town, at least as I understand it, is we're trying to put more of the tasks um, onto the, the responsibility of daytime government. And the town engineer is daytime government. The conservation committee is nighttime government. And that, uh, uh, even with perhaps their wisdom and experience and in this case, maybe lack of authority, it just seems to be going in the wrong direction. So uh, um, I would not be in favor of that. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Sasso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, I'm just curious, uh, and, I, and I do believe this is related to the, to the uh, motions at, at hand. Um, how are we dealing with this in the stormwater management section of the bylaw? Because I'm assuming now that we're moving impervious service into the definition section, this is going to apply across there, and you know we've added these these verb this verbiage here. Does that exist as as it is today in that section as well? Are we adding something here that's going to be inconsistent with the other area of the bylaw, or is it something completely separate? And I apologize, I don't have my version of the bylaw here today, so I. I, I didn't have a chance to check it. If you could just be curious what the status is of, of that, because um, that is another area where we do um, assess the percentage used by a homeowner that may not be in aquifer protection, um, but we're trying to, I assume, encourage similar approaches to the um, addressing um, impervious surface, surf, surface, excuse me. Okay, I assume we're taking a look at that.
Will you be a few minutes at that? Okay, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get an answer and move okay. on. Are Thank there you. other uh, people that have not spoken yet? No, okay, Mr. Hecht. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Bill Hecht. Um, this is back on the or issue. It is cited as of in the definitions as well, so I believe if we accept the or in um, section Article 9, we have to change it to or in uh, the definitions where it says impervious surface. It's the same of or confusion. Do we have a comment on that? I think we have a couple of things, a couple of questions going right now. Um, pardon me? Did you not hear the question? We changed the of to or in one section. You're saying, which, which section did we also need to change it in? You felt? Definitions. In definitions. Oh, you got it right here. Okay. My earlier comment stands in both sections, that they are two different sources of, of infiltration. One is a surface runoff, the other is precipitation itself. And I think the intention is to differentiate between the two, okay? because they are different sources of, in, of uh, possible infiltration. So the or is necessary, I think, in both cases rather than the of. Because the presumption is that all, if you read it as of, the presumption is all surface runoff is a result of precipitation. That's not true. You can have surface runoff for a whole bunch of reasons, like it rained two days ago and the swamp overflowed, et cetera. So we have two questions that they are working on. Uh, why are they working on that? Is there any other discussion? Ms. Herrick. Thank you. Uh, Karen Herrick, Precinct 8. Um, I was just looking. I appreciate the clean copy. Uh, thank you for providing that to us. Um, in, I was just wondering, um, th there's a typo in the clean section, so uh, we're going to go through that with a fine tooth comb because there's an or missing. Uh, maybe I'll just tell you about it anyway. Um, section 10.332, letter F, it should say storage of liquid hazardous or liquid protein, propane products. Just be an or in there. Thank you. In the clean copy, section um, 10.332, um, letter F. Yeah, in between liquid hazardous, there should be an or liquid petroleum. I see the word storage of liquid hazardous. And then there should be an or. Oh, I see. Yeah, and then it should just say liquid okay. petroleum products. Piling up the, um, the questions here. Uh, that one is uh, th that correct that we, we should put the motion is correct? So we don't need the or? You do need the or. It's, oh, it's in the motion. Okay, so it's just, it's just missing on that, the document that you have, but it was part of the motion. 
Excuse me. Okay, Mr. Mayors. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I think I have the answer. You, the question was raised whether by changing the definition of impervious surface and um, putting it in the definition section, does that mean that it's applicable throughout the zoning bylaw? The answer is yes. And it does actually appear, and the term does actually appear in a couple of the specialized um, districts like the Municipal, um, what's it called? Municipal Reuse District. Um, um, there was already a definition of impervious surfaces uh, that this one will replace, but I think it, this is this is correct, and it should um, cascade um, throughout the rest of the bylaw. And and uh, I'm confident that it doesn't create any any unintended consequences. So. The result is you feel it should be or in all cases? I, I was having trouble hearing you actually. Whoa. <laughs> Don't want to knock down Mary Poppins. No. The, um, uh, no, I was actually answering a different question, oh, which oh. Was, but I'm yes, sorry. it should be an or in both places. And uh, to be clear, um, it's not really, won't end up appearing in, in two places. The way that's set up, it, it um, showed where it was going to be added, and then oh, where it was going to be removed, it fixed it too, but then, but then said, and moved to section 2.0. So it, when we're all done, it will only be in 2.0. Um, but it should be or. But the question I was answering oh, was, once you move it to 2.0, does that mean it applies throughout the zoning bylaw? And the answer is yes, and that's the result we're looking for. Mr. Mon? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. I just want to point out tonight, we've heard from Council that pervious pavers are not impervious surface, so you could, if you were in the Aquifer Protection District, you could pave your entire lot with pervious pavers, and according to Town Council, you'd be in compliance with this law. And we've also heard tonight, and I know from personal experience, that engineering does not allow the use of pervious pavers. They consider it impervious surface. So we have two very different opinions. Perhaps this amendment does not resolve that conflict, but I think the conflict is apparent. And if this motion does not, this amendment does not pass, I think we do need an instructional um, a, a, an instructional amendment or a proposal to resolve this problem because those of us on the Conservation Commission face this indecision and controversy every time we get a permit. So we need some instruction and guidance and the Conservation Commission is, is happy to work with uh, CPDC to provide that. And I would also like to add that the Conservation Commission approval of these stormwater uh, control mechanisms, I think, provides an additional perspective than engineering has. Engineering, rightfully so, concentrates on the flooding and drainage and getting the water away from homes as fast as possible, which is important, and I support that too. But the Conservation Commission is looking at the quality of the water and also storing the water in the ground so that during periods of low rainfall, the streams don't dry up. So I think engineering and conservation commission working together like twins can come up with a better solution. So I would propose having both look at this. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Actually, the, this, the gentleman in the back. Yes. Uh, Tom Wise, Precinct 3. 
A um, couple of quick points. As somebody who has been through the ringer and back again with town government, both night and day, um, I would suggest we keep it as simple as possible. And I am therefore opposed to the AND Conservation Commission. That said, I'm a little surprised that Mr. Mon did not suggest a change at the end to make this the Conservation Commission's domain. You can decide whether you want to do that or not. Um, as for the pervious pavers, as I've been through town government day and night and town council dealing with settlements of cases, I would suggest simply that we ask town council to tell the engineer that, an impervious, that a pervious paver is a pervious placement and be done with it. There's no need for any sort of special study and waste of our time and money. So, thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Mr. Tuttle. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dave Tuttle of Precinct 3 and CPDC. The a pervious paver is not a natural substance. It's an artificial mechanism which can be easily considered, as Mr. Safina mentioned, it can be considered as one of the methods of infiltration. But it is not um, a pervious surface. It's not grass. It's not sand. So I, I am strongly opposed to the amendment. Further discussion? Not appearing. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Herring. Thank you, Karen Herrick, Precinct 8. So I've lived in Precinct 8 in the Aquifer District for 20 years. Uh, I, I'm like amazed. We know the Conservation Commission really wants to protect um, the wetland areas. And to have them up here saying, we think the town engineer is being too strict, I think is remarkable for this town. Um, and I live next to a vernal pool, so there you go. Um, but I have to tell you, pervious pavers and pervious pavement are not cheap solutions. I, I, I also I hate to think that we would um, put the town engineer in a position of enforcing people who are out to do something, then rip it up. And I don't think our town people are going to do that anyway. Um, Wilmington allows porous pavement and it's right next to the aquifer district and um, other towns do as well. Um, and I will tell you that there are patios, as the previous speaker said, going in in the aquifer district because of this problem coming out of town hall that even though pervious materials are okay with DEP and should be taken into the calculation, as a matter of practice, there haven't been. Um, so if we don't get this amendment passed, uh, I. I I would also agree with an instructional motion, but I think the residents of Precinct 8 and the Aquifer District need as much relief as we can give them as allowed by uh, Mass DEP. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes, Mr. Sasso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, just two, th two things. One, on follow-up to the question that I asked earlier, I guess my, my, my real intent was just to understand how we were going to be consistent throughout the bylaw in respect, again, not just to aquifer protection, but to, but to stormwater management, and how these, these, this terminology was going to apply. Um, so for example, if we do allow for our artificial recharge systems in other districts where uh, a homeowner would, would cross a different threshold, um, which is different than what's in aquifer protection, that we apply the same standards and approaches. I guess that was my, fir that was my first point. And I guess secondly, having thought about this, and again, I, I'm at this point uh, on the camp of potentially uh, looking at an instruct instructional motion instead of trying to engineer this on town meeting floor. But um, it, it sounds to me that a system of artificial recharge, as other folks have indicated, it may include pervious pavers. And that, in and of itself, um, if that is appropriately and defined in the other areas as well, then perhaps what we need is a definition of that in our in our bylaw as well to resolve. It. So instead of adding this particular item into the standard itself, or to try to change the impervious surface definition, which which comes from DEP, 
uh, we may be better off looking at defining what systems of artificial recharge are and how they're applied instead of trying to engineer something like this here. So um, I guess I would be voting against this motion and I would uh, suggest and support um, a, an instructional motion to look into this a little bit more detail because I don't think we're going to solve it here. And I do want to make sure it is consistent across all of the districts and all of the requirements that fall under these types of approaches. Thank you. So another hand over here? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tony DiRezzo, uh, Precinct 2. If I could ask uh, someone to go back to section 10.3.3 of the original definitions. And what you'll see is the original definition of impervious surface. And I know the town engineer or the town building inspector does not like the pervious pavers, but the reality is he's not allowed to. The section says uh, specifically uh, roofs, decks, driveways, parking areas, roadways, and walkways, regardless of the proposed surface material. So at this point, town uh, staff is only doing what the bylaw currently says. They're not allowed to consider the perviousness of the material. The way the current bylaw is without the amendment will allow town staff to consider pervious material when they're making the calculations to determine how much of the area is pervious or impervious. I would recommend voting against both amendments. Thank you. Further discussion? Are we ready for the vote? Okay, the first piece of this will be adding the words and Conservation Commission, and the Conservation Commission. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion does not carry. The next uh, part of this amendment is the rest of it, the, uh, the one, the, the, the number one, and then two, and everything following that. All those in favor of the uh, proposed amendment, raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion does not carry. And Mr. Mon, if you do intend to uh, make an instructional motion, I would like you to put it in writing so we'll know exactly what you're proposing. Okay. Now we're back to the main motion as amended. Is there further discussion? None appearing. This requires a two-thirds vote. Do I have my counters from the other night? Mr. Brown, Mr. Crook, Mr. Rushworth, and uh, Ms. Russell. All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please rise. Mr. Crook? 23. 23. 33. 33. 33. 33. 35. And those opposed? Zero. 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 Business under Article 10, the, hand, the motion is made by Mr. Hansen. Mr. Lalasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. Um, Article 10 is fairly straightforward. If I'm doing a zoning ball, you know it has to be. Um, for those of us that sat through the last couple of town meetings in January when we did the charter, there was a lot of discussion and the decision was to leave broad language into the charter so that more specific detail for associate members could be put into a general bylaw. <clears throat> this body did that in May and approved one. And in August, the Attorney General disallowed some portion of that general bylaw and asked us to instead take the action proposed tonight, which specifically is for CPDC and ZBA. Um, to have associate members only with the zoning bylaw. And so the, the differences are um, the general bylaw is very, I'll say, I don't know, broad, and it then um, would result in some things that the charter specified. So for instance, the charter said uh, two members and three year terms for ZBA. So the general bylaw would have gone along with that and allowed that. Um, however, um, we were cautioned that the CPDC has only allowed one associate member because of the state zoning act, so that is a change. 
Uh, specifically for CBDC, there's the language. It's just added on to uh, section 431 and 432 as a new section. It says there'll be one associate member. Um, there will be a two-year term, and then the language is identical otherwise to the general bylaw. Similar for ZBA, with the differences of two associate members and a three-year term, and then identical language to the general bylaw. And just as a point of information, uh, the Board of Selectmen sometime this winter, should this pass and be approved by the Attorney General, will be meeting with all board chairs and vice chairs to discuss associate members so there's a clear understanding among all volunteers uh, what the rules and regulations, if you will, are for associate members. We haven't had a need for associate members to vote yet, but we know that that will come up at some point. We want to make sure all the boards and committees are educated. CPDC report, Mr. Safina. Uh, at a public hearing on October 5th, 2015, CPDC voted 400 to recommend Article 10. Bylaw Committee report, Mr. Crook. The Bylaw Committee at their meeting of October 13th voted 500 to recommend this article. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote. I will take, I will try a hand count, and if it's unanimous, we will move on. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Business under Article 11, motion made by Mr. Ensminger. Presentation, Mr. Malasha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'd also place this issue as a housekeeping item. Um, this is to update a general bylaw by to agree with the Charter. Um, you can see in your uh, warrant report the simple striking of a phrase and just replacing it with in, co in accordance with the provisions of Section 812 of the Reading Home Rule Charter. And um, just again as a reminder, the, uh, the new Section 812 of the Home Rule Charter is actually a lot more detailed than this bylaw was as to the you know, rules and regulations and process of removal in addition to the rights of the volunteer. So I suggest you make this uh, housekeeping amendment. Bylaw Committee Report, Mr. Crook. At their meeting of, what was, uh, let me find this. Uh, October 13th, the Bylaw Committee voted 500 to recommend this article. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Munn. Jamie Munn, Precinct 4, and, and just a question. Does this include the Board of Selectmen? No, it does not include elected boards. There's a different process for elected boards. And then just a, another question. At the bottom, it says, or take any other action with respect thereto. Is that part of the original language? Or is it just a typo that's left in there? It seems out of place. Um, that's, that should not be and is not in the final motion. That's the way you do word articles, though. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moria. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. More of a parliamentary uh, procedure than anything. I continually hear uh, votes with the abstention votes. Robert's Rules of Order clearly states there should be no abstention votes, period. Further discussion? Was there in the back? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Stanley Moran, Precinct 7. Uh, in, in the fourth line, uh, talks about uh, the uh, request the appointing authority to remove such absenting member from his membership. I believe that it should be its membership. We, will you allow a uh, 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 amend, friendly amendment, thank you. We're, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't see where you're... So it's the fourth line down. So it's, the line starts, appointing authority to remove such absenting member from his membership. And it should be its membership. That is actually part of the... Uh, 
Right, right. Yeah, that w the its would not be grammatically correct. Yeah, the bylaws state that anything that says his means his or hers. Uh, okay. No, I'm not referring to. You can't remove. Oh, you're talking about the, the committee itself. I see. You, yes. I, I see. Uh, Thank you. Such a, well, it's. Are you referring to, uh, up here, are you referring to the it's at the, thir at the end of the third line? Or the his at, at the fourth line? So it, in the handbook, it's in the fourth line. So but what, but up here, where, where is it up here? Yes, where it's highlighted in blue. I believe this is part of. I believe this is part of the uh, current bylaw, and it's not something that we're changing. So, whether it's right or wrong, we cannot. We cannot change that. That's not part of the. Okay, uh, thank you. Then I think. I, I do see your point, though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we had a discussion at our first uh, meeting earlier uh, this week about uh, you know one of the senior members of town meeting said that he had found you know five or eight uh, grammatical errors. Uh, I don't think there's any great urgency uh, for this to be changed at this town meeting and that at a subsequent town meeting, uh, you know, I think the Board of Selectmen should make a proposal where we fix the wording of it. Uh, why should so many people have to sit through, uh, you know, squabbles over uh, grammar when, you know, we're talking about eighth grade grammar, not, you know, uh, legalese or anything like that. Uh, I, I don't think there's any reason why we need to uh, to adopt this because this represents, you know, the vote of town meeting, and uh, I think we need to send a message to the boards and the committees uh, that are presenting documents for us to consider that if there's a typo, if there's a comma missing, well, fix it before you send it to us. You know. It's a matter of respect in my view. Thank you. Mr. Lalasher. Um, whether or not I agree with your general principle, I disagree with your statement that this is an error. I believe his is correct. Its membership is referring to the board, and they're, ref they're removing one member from his membership on that board. I think it's correct. Further discussion? Mr. Crook. Stephen Crook, uh, chair of the bylaw committee. The bylaw committee right now is actually in the process of reviewing the general bylaw for, for any inconsistencies with the recently revised charter and would certainly welcome any, any input from citizens if they've identified missed words, missed punctuation, that sort of thing. In fact, we're actually meeting next Tuesday night at 7.30 in the town hall. So if people, if people are aware of things that they think are wrong, if they could email town hall and call attention to them. We can look at them. Thank you. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the motion under Article 11, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 12, a motion is made by Mr. Halsey. Presentation, Mr. Malasha. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Third time's a charm. This article has been on the table for town meeting, two other town meetings. Um, in just to give a little bit of history to those of you that knew, um, the issue was back several decades when the town disposed um, of some rubbish in a landfill. And when I say the town, I mean the hauler that the town hired. Uh, in December of 2014, we first became aware of an issue. Um, we had a lot of back and forth, and by we, I mean mostly Ray, um, with the per people who are conducting a rather significantly large class action lawsuit on a Superfund site. We've done a lot of background work over the last year. We've offered settlements. We've gone through um, very old receipts, um, very you know sporadic paperwork, if you will, on the other side. The Board of Selectmen has met a couple times in executive sessions, 
and uh, we now have a final settlement finally to propose to town meeting. Um, importantly, uh, at least as importantly, at least from my perspective as to the dollar figure, was legal language that would put this away forever. Um, it's very difficult to defend yourself against you know, poor paperwork on both sides from 30 and 40 years ago, so we wanted to just put this away. So the proposal in front of you is to take $125,000 from free cash. Um, the selectmen next Tuesday will be asked to authorize the town manager to uh, s sign a settlement if this article passes, uh, and that will be the end of it. The alternative is we'll spend probably at least as much as this in litigation alone and could face multiples of what is, um, what is asked for in the future, or we could get lucky and not spend quite as much, but I think the odds are very high that it would cost more than this. Finance Committee Report, Ms. Alvarado. Finance Committee recommends Article 12 by a vote of 6-0-0 at the meeting on October 14, 2015. Further discussion? Not appearing. We'll be ready for the vote. All those in favor of the motion under Article 12, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Do we have a motion under Article 13? Thank you, Mr. Mario. Bill Brown, Precinct 8, Mr. member Brown. of the uh, Cemetery Board of Trustees. Uh, you gave us $200,000, uh, 200,000 reasons why to indefinitely postpone this article. Thank you. We have a motion to indefinitely postpone. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? None appearing. All those in favor of the motion to indefinitely postpone, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Uh, excuse me. We have indefinitely postponed. Uh, business under Article 14. Uh, Mr. Sexton makes the motion. Mr. Sexton. Thank you, Mr. Moderator and town meeting members. Article 14 came out of an instructional motion you see on the screen, specifically the last bullet point. On May 5th, 2015, the Volunteer Appointment Subcommittee interviewed candidates to be on the Ad Hoc Reading Firearm Safety Committee, which would then serve as the working group requested in the instructional motion. As you can see, making sure the committee had representation from all stakeholders in the community was of the utmost importance to the Board of Selectmen. I served as the chair of the committee, along with Selectman John Halsey, who served as the secretary. Are the two Selectmen representatives, Deputy Chief Mark Segala is the police chief's designee, Bryn Burkhardt is the Timonex Swamp Area resident, as well as vice chair of the committee. We also have three other residents of the community on the committee, Jonathan Scully, David Panette, and Ken Lafferty, who is also the town meeting member representative of the committee, as you can see in the middle section of how we propose to set up this committee. I would like to first thank these appointees for their willingness to serve on the committee and for their thoughtfulness, insight, and expertise they brought to the many discussions the committee had over five meetings this past summer. Secondly, it's important to point out the makeup of this committee. Some are licensed gun owners, concerned residents, police, Board of Selectmen represent representatives, as well as were aided by town council at most of our meetings. The Board of Selectmen felt it was important to have such a makeup to ensure an open, fair, informed process in whichever path the committee decided was best. First thing the committee did was to examine our current bylaw to see what revisions could be made per the request of town meetings instructional motion. After discussing revisions to the current bylaw, we took the advice of town council, who took issue with the language and structure of the current bylaw, and believed that a total revision would allow the committee to create something that is more user friendly. Uh, the committee then charged the town council with writing a new bylaw and several versions for discussion at our next meetings. After looking at those versions and discussing the effect they would have on both property owners' rights and the community as a whole, a compromise for all stakeholders involved was brought to the committee by John Halsey and then modified by the committee.
As you can see in the proposed bylaw, the first section defines, uh, excuse me, uh, what, what you actually see on the screen tonight uh, is what the committee voted to recommend as the proposed bylaw. The first section defines what a firearm shall mean in clear and easy to understand manner. It reads, firearm shall mean a pistol, revolver, rifle, shotgun, or other weapon of any description from which a bullet or shot can be discharged using a propellant power. The proposed bylaw goes on to clearly lay out what is and what is not considered authorized discharge of a firearm. The discharge is prohibited section reads, except as provided in sections 8.9.1.3, no person shall fire or discharge any firearm of any kind on, over, or onto of any street, highway, park, or other public property, or within 1,000 feet from a dwelling or other building in use, or 300 feet from a public way, or on, over, or onto any private property except by the owner or legal occupant thereof, or a person carrying the written consent of such owner, which shall be valid for no more than one year from its issuance, and which shall be available for review upon the request of any law enforcement officer. Lastly, the proposed bylaw defines authorized discharges. Authorized discharges, the prohibition set forth in section 8.9.1.2 shall not apply to the use of such weapons in the lawful defense of any person, family, or property, or any law enforcement officer or member of the armed forces acting within the scope of lawfully authorized duties, or the use of such weapons on any lawfully permitted target, trap, or skeet range. You can see how the second bullet point on the discharges prohibits, prohibited limits where you can discharge a firearm in town. When you look closely at the map, you'll notice, for example, you can no longer stand in Stop and Shop's parking lot and discharge a firearm, or Jordan's parking lot, or Home Depot's parking lot. It also eliminates Timberneck Swamp as an area that you can discharge a firearm, so adding these setbacks of 1,000 feet from a dwelling or 300 feet from a public way will exclude areas around town that people use both recre recreationally and daily. <clears throat> what you see on the map right now is a, a representation of uh, the existing, um, part of the existing bylaw which has 500 feet from a dwelling and 150 feet from a public way. And as I slide it over, you can see the sections in green that will be affected under the proposed bylaw. I'll put both maps up so it's easier to compare them. In summation, this proposed firearm bylaw, I feel, addresses some pretty common sense issues of where a firearm can be lawfully discharged, is more representative of the close proximity town we live in, and still protects the rights of property owners. Thank you very much. Bylaw committee report, Mr. Crook. The bylaw committee at their meeting of October 13th voted 5-0-0 to recommend this article to town meeting. Further discussion? Mr. Tuttle. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, David Tuttle, Precinct 3. I was, I'm fully, fully in favor of the proposal. It looks like a very good and thoughtful uh, law. I'm a little bit surprised by the restriction in the definition that says propellant powder. 
there's some number of other things, including electromagnetic railgun kind of technology that should be perhaps included in the uh, scope of the bylaw. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tony Toro, Precinct 1. A uh, couple items. The, uh, this original petition that started last year, uh, those people sold their house and moved out of town shortly after they proposed it. So we know where they stood. Uh, the rhetoric... <laughs> I had no idea I could stand in Home Depot and fire a firearm, Mr. Sexton. I don't know where that came from. I, you know, I understand, you know, there's a procedure, and, you know, we all have our issues here. Um, but when, when rhetoric like that, I, I can't fathom where that would come from, from a, from a town leader that would make a statement like that. It, it's blatantly false, first of all. Um, it, it's never happened. We, you know, we've got a solution looking for a problem here. You know, we, we had all these alleged cases of these noises that people heard in the in Timbernex Swamp. And, you know, there was never a case of it proven to be a firearm. Not once. Uh, I, you know, correct me, Chief, if I'm wrong. Uh, and I ask, you know, going forward, when it happens again, because it will, when we hear that noise, then what do we do? You know, we've, we have a knee-jerk reaction and, and I, I want to ask you again, where did that come from that makes you think you could stand in Home Depot or wherever and shoot a firearm? Do we have an answer, Mr. Sexton? Yep, be happy to answer that. This right now represents in green where you can, on private land, uh, fire a, um, a firearm. Okay. This right, excuse me, I believe it's... This parcel right here is both um, Home Depot and Jordan's. As well as over here, this is the stop and shop parcel. So as you can see, clearly in, in the green, you are allowed to. In the parking lot, when state law prohibits firing a firearm within 500 feet of a building. The building is, um, you'd be outside of 500 feet in sections of that parking area, correct? And 500 feet from any other dwelling? Correct. And stop and shop? Correct. I don't believe it. Well, if I, if I stand corrected with the distances, okay. And, you know, but again, that's the kind of things that, you know, people say to frighten people and make you think that somebody could actually do that or would or ever has. Further discussion? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Diderio? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Under Dario Precinct 6, I certainly support this article. I just have one question, um, maybe for, uh, for Kevin. What happened to hunting? Is I, I remember uh, previously hunting was allowed or it's allowed in the state. So I notice on authorized discharges, it's not there. I'm kind of fine with not being there, but uh, I'm just wondering what happened. How, how did that work? Yes, Mr. Miari. Under state law, we're not allowed to regulate hunting, and so we didn't do it. Mr. Wells, did you have a question? Oh, no. Oh, Mr. Wells, yes. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Weld, Precinct 7. Um, I've been informed uh, within reasonable certainty that there has been no personal property damage or personal injury due to the recreational discharge of a firearm in this town, uh, at least for the past 30 years. And I would posit that since we've been a town, I would defer to our town historian, Mr. Brown, on that fact. But um, as someone else said earlier, this is a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. Um, do I want people running around blazing away in Timberneck Swamp? No, but guess what? They're not anyway. So as far as town government's concerned, I think it needs to be the least restrictive that it can be, especially in regards to property rights. So the fact that it's not a problem, and I know that the argument will be made, well, what if it is a problem? Well, at that point, I would say we address it. But there's nothing to address right now. So I would, um, I'm certainly not going to vote in favor of this because we're restricting property rights when there's no need to. Thank you. Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 6. Uh, years back, we had a discussion here when we opened up uh, three areas in the town to bow hunting during deer season. My understanding then, and I think the understanding of most people here, was that there, we had a general ban on the discharge of firearms. I'm not in favor of this because I feel we are too dense, we're a different kind of community than we were many, many years ago, and we should have a general ban on the discharge of firearms in this community. I want to state that I looked at the minutes of the meeting of the Firearms Safety Committee. I appreciate all the work that everyone put into it. I would disagree that it was representative of the community. If only one out of the seven members is a female, it's not representative. Um, in looking at the minutes, at meeting number three and at meeting number four, um, the police representatives, it states in the minutes, Deputy Chief Mark Sagala stated that he and Chief Cormier favor option number one, which is a general ban on any discharge of firearms with the logical exceptions noted up here, as it is the most restrictive and safest for our community, per their opinion. In the third meeting, um, no, sorry, I think I'm mixed up here. I'm sorry, in the meeting previous to that, meeting number two, it was quoted in the minutes that Deputy Chief Sagala mentioned that it's the police position that there be no discharge in town for the safety of the public. Now, my experience here with town meeting is that we generally listen to the police when it comes to matters of safety. I have beyond me why that wasn't followed by this committee. Um, I think it's um, a very serious oversight and we need to talk about that. Thank you. And I will not vote in favor of this bylaw. I think it needs to be turned down and we need to ask the selectman or the bylaw t committee to come back with a general dis discharge ban of firearms in Reading. Thank you. Here with the discussion, Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom O'Rourke, Precinct 2. Uh, just to refresh our collective memories, when we discussed this at last town meeting, I think there was hours, really, literally, of discussion on clarifying the existing bylaw. And so I think, number one, I, I uh, applaud the committee for eliminating a lot of the confusion. There was also a lot of discussion, and, and I live in the general area, although I don't have children of that age in, anymore, but there's a, a concerns about the safety. It's a, it's a very heavily populated area of young children. It's been a neighborhood that's transitioned, and, and I will say, based on the Halloween count, there's probably uh, 60 or 80 kids in the circle of area uh, around uh, Timberneck, just in my street. And as someone said, it's a fully developed town now. I mean, it's not the uh, town of our forefathers. And I, you know, I think intuitively, the concept of firearms being discharged within the kind of distances we're talking about in the existing bylaw, it to, to me, is a, is a potential serious danger. And to the point of nothing happened, I mean, generally, I agree with that proposition. But you know, the stakes are high, so I, I don't think we should always be reacting to a problem that are, uh, has happened. Uh, I think this is an opportunity to be proactive. Uh, I think this gets us a lot further than we have been, so I'm in favor of this amendment. Thank you. 
Further discussion? Yes. Yes, you. No, no, um, Ms. Benio, you can be next, but you, the gentleman. Good evening, Eric Forney, uh, Precinct 6. I wanted to propose two amendments to this. Uh, the first one would be in 8.9.1.3, uh, the last bullet, the use of such weapons on any lawfully permitted, I want to include the word hunting, comma, target, trap, or skeet range. You're adding it to the last bullet, any Correct. lawfully permitted hunting, target, trap, or skeet range? Correct. Right. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, Mr. Fournier? The second well, amendment? We'll, we'll take one at a time. Okay. So you want to speak on that, or you all? It's clearly a legally permitted opportunity uh, to discharge weapons in the state for hunting purposes. For the town to take that out of here is um, really encroaching on the rights of hunters. As I said before, we're not allowed to um, regulate hunting. There is no, um, uh, there is nothing in the bylaw that me even mentions hunting. If we put the word hunting in there, then you will be regulating hunting, which we can't do. Excuse me if I'm wrong, but I believe hunting was in the original bylaw, which was put in discussion during the previous town meetings. Indeed. So I'm asking to put it back in. And I'm advising you not to put it back in because we can't regulate hunting. You're, you're not regulating hunting, you're regulating the opportunity to hunt with a weapon. There's a difference between regulation of hunting, which is saying that I would not be able to bow hunt in this city or in this town. What I'm saying is if we have the ability to hunt by mass general law and I have legal <coughs> opportunity to hunt with a weapon, there are two different things. Mr. Mayors? We are allowed to regulate the discharge of firearms. We are not allowed to regulate hunting. I don't want to see the word, my strong recommendation is that the word hunting should not appear in this bylaw. Understand that means that hunting is not regulated in any way in this bylaw. It just means that whatever hunting it goes on cannot involve the discharge of a firearm. So, so therefore you're regulating hunting? By, by not having it in or, or having it in, either way you're regulating hunting. Mr. Mayor, that is not my opinion, no. Are you continuing with your amendment? It's, it's your I right. am. Okay. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. Okay. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ian Brown, Precinct 8. Um, with regards to, I, I agree that there isn't a problem right now, but the last thing I, I want, and I think any of us want, is to wait till, sure, maybe it's in the swamp or the woods or wherever. The last thing I think we should do is wait till someone gets shot to address this problem. Keep in mind, we're actually talking about the proposed amendment right now. Yes, the, um, when I mean the, uh, yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. Uh, Massachusetts has hunting laws, so hunting is allowed and it's broken down by districts throughout the state. Some districts don't allow hunting, restrict it very much in the state law. Uh, one of the things you can do, you cannot have a rifle other than a 22 in, in uh, this area, north, the north uh, east section of Massachusetts. It's funny, if you're hunting for a coyote, you can have a a rifle 308. Otherwise, you cannot have a rifle. Shotgun, 
black powder and, and archery are hunting and you can hunt. You post your land properly, you can't hunt. So you have that option as a landowner. So it doesn't really restrict hunting. The town shouldn't and can't. I don't. I think the uh, the uh, lawyer is correct. We should not have the word hunting in there. You're not prohibiting hunting other than by state regulations. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Herrick. Uh, Steve Herrick, Precinct 8. Uh, yeah, the proposed amendment is total non-starter because if you look at it, you'll read the whole section. It says the prohibition set forth in section 8912 shall not apply to the use of such weapons on any lawfully permitted hunting in ipso facto. That means that you can hunt within 20 feet of somebody's house so long as you're in, um, so every restriction we have up above is out the window. So that means that it's a, it's a free for all. So clearly that has to come out and based on my reading of this, everyone's acting like where this is, keeps you from hunting. It keeps you from hunting a thousand feet, within a thousand feet of a dwelling or 300 feet of a road. So yeah, maybe those are not the um, uh, most convenient places to get to, but they exist in town. So I think this is a well-designed um, uh, uh, warrant uh, article without any changes. I thoroughly approve it. Good job. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Ms. Docker? Nancy Doctor, Precinct 1. Um, I also agree that hunting should not be included. Actually, now that we know red meat is carcinogenic, hunting should be added to a long list of public health concerns associated with guns. And, you know, this is a growing issue. I have to commend the citizens who actually brought this to our attention. I applaud the committee who actually, you know, met and prevent, you know, and is presenting this. I have to agree, I don't think it's going far enough when people actually have said that this is not a problem, there's 85 deaths every single day from gun violence. I'm going to vote for this amendment and I hope it's the start of more stricter regulations about gun use in our town. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Not appearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Jonathan Scully, District 7. I was actually uh, part of this committee ad hoc committee and had uh, the privilege of working with many of these uh, fine young men up here uh, and ladies if he is in here. Yes, he is. <laughs> um, we did work hard. Uh, we, we, we did see that there was um, a lot of differing uh, stances on this, um, but my, my particular stance from where I came from was that uh, there is a regulation of hunting here by specifically omitting it. Um, I think that that's wrong by specifically omitting something saying that you're not prohibiting it. You are prohibiting it by doing that. Um, with that, I'd like to make an amendment. Well, we have one amendment before us right now. Uh, that's, we will take care of that before we take another one. Okay. Okay, I will call on you again. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? No appearing. The proposal before us is to add the word hunting before target, trap, or skeet range. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion does not carry. Uh, I'll first, we'll go back to Mr. Fournier. You had a second one? Second proposed amendment? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Eric Fournier, uh, Precinct 6. Uh, back to 8.9.1.2, uh, the second bullet, I wanted to uh, change the distances to 500 feet from 1,000 feet and 150 feet from 300 feet to coincide with Mass General Law 131, Section 58. Did you get that? Just making sure we, um, what, what was the second number, I'm sorry, in, in place of the 300, what did you, you say? Have, you have the numbers correct. And it was to okay. coincide with Mass General Law okay. 131, Section 58. Okay, is there a second? Second. Mr. Fournier, any discussion? 
in my opinion, I feel like the numbers that have been proposed by the committee are putting us in jeopardy of being uh, in not in compliance with state law. So I, to move it back to being in compliance with state law. Ms. Mayors? I did actually check with the Attorney General on that point, and the Attorney General has uh, indicated that towns are free to be more strict than what the state law requires. So this bylaw has been pre-approved by the Attorney General already. Okay. I'm staying with the amendment. Sure. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Mr. Weld? It's my contention that these numbers were selected to effectively eliminate the recreational discharge of a firearm in this town. Um, if you put that map back up there, you will see that virtually every single place, not all, but the large majority of permissible locations have been eliminated and it's due to the distance restrictions. Again, there has been no problem other than noise, unsubstantiated noise. For government to restrict property rights on that basis is a pretty flimsy reason to do it. Further discussion, Mr. Mon. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. First, I'd like to thank the committee. This is, um, this article, this proposed bylaw is very simple, clear, even I can understand it. I'm surprised it got past town council. So thank you very much to the committee. Um, with regard to the amendment, I, I have a question. It's, it's my understand, uh, first question is, the definition of firearms, as I read it, does not include fireworks. Is, is that correct? And our f discharge of fireworks regulated by the town or by state law? They're regulated by state law. And as I understand it, state law prohibits the discharge of any fireworks within Massachusetts. Is that correct? Mr. Mayor? Not quite, but the but uh, it does require a special license that only professional fireworks companies have. Thank you. So we have decided that fireworks are too dangerous to discharge in the town. Yet the the existing law uh, with, and the proposed amendment with those setbacks would allow discharge of shotguns and rifles uh, where we don't even allow fireworks. So I I think the restriction on um, on discharge of firearms should be at least as exclusive as the discharge of fireworks, so I would not support reducing the, uh, the distances. Further discussion on people who have not spoken yet? Mr. Mandel? Bob Mandel, Precinct 6. I just have a hypothetical that I'd like uh, answered. Um, say I have a hen house on my property and there's a fox in the hen house. So am I allowed to shoot the fox with a 22 caliber? Do we have a response? Mr. Meares? Well, I'm tempted to say I don't answer hi uh, hypothetical questions, but uh, but this one I think is reasonably straightforward. That's the reason why it says lawful defense of property. So yes. There was a question over here and yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jennifer Hillary, Precinct 7. May I ask the committee members how the numbers in the original proposal, 1,000 feet and 300 feet were chosen? <clears throat> And what, if any, bylaws were used as a comparison for those numbers? Do we have a response? Yes. Mr. Hall. I'm 
I'm John Halsey from Precinct 1 and a member of this committee. The, the numbers were not exactly arbitrary, but rather functional around a, a thought process towards both compromise and common sense. So when you look at the map, is the map up behind me? Or maybe you can put that up, Bob. Um, <clears throat> there was some work done with our mapping specialist here in the town and said, okay, what, what would represent some common sense that would protect citizens in certain areas from errant gunfire at too close a distance? And so you begin the process by saying, okay, we're at 300 feet and 150 feet from a highway. And then you begin to work out and you look at what it does to the map. And as you continue to work out, you find that at a certain point in time, certain areas, the first one that, was a, that came as a result of the instructional motion to the Board of Selectmen to create this committee, Timberneck Swamp. Timberneck Swamp is an island that's privately owned, surrounded by conservation land, surrounded by residential property full of mischievous and interested children that want to run around in the woods. So maybe that's a place that common sense says um, discharge of firearms might not be a wise choice. So when you begin to let those distances expand, what you find is that certain areas stop being green and they disappear off those maps. So that was, that was moved forward until we found certain areas that actually made sense to limit the discharge for public safety reasons and common sense reasons. Um, for example, uh, there's another spot up um, that is on the map on the right in the upper left quadrant. You can stand there, I've done it, um, in a spot that at 300 feet and 150 is perfectly legal uh, to discharge a firearm today. If the property owner says it's okay and you know other certain criteria were met. If you're standing in that spot, you could look at the playground at the Wood End School. I, it just didn't make sense. So again, you know, you start to apply the distances until you found a distance that actually seemed to make those places that didn't make sense um, to go away and at the same time try to preserve as much in the way of property owners rights as made sense in the common good because as we talked in the committee as you might imagine there were some people in the committee that had a position that said you know maybe we shouldn't be shooting guns at all in town and other people said, well, maybe we shouldn't fool with it because it's not a problem yet. And so the process of the committee and the actual common sense approach to public safety by looking at the map brought us to a place that these numbers seem to make the most sense given what the remainder of locations where you could still legitimately discharge a firearm recreationally and in, in a sporting way. So that's kind of how we got to where we got. I mean, we looked at we looked at 750 and 200. I mean, you know, it was a progression, and it struck me that when we got to a certain number and the map looked a certain way, that it was time for the committee to consider it as a group and see if that was a reasonable compromise to both public safety, common sense, and property owners' rights. And so that's how we got where we are. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, may I make one comment as well? The numbers seem to be one of the most significant differences from the bylaw as it currently stands. And in response to some of the commentary that this is creating a problem where there was none, from just a um, blanket review, the current bylaw gives no numbers which would make it enforceable. It states just within the limits of any street, highway, park, or other public property, which gives discretion to those who are enforcing the bylaws. Uh, 
So the numbers seem to be critical in the enforceability of the bylaw. Um, but thank you for that historical perspective. Yes, right here. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Eric Burkhardt, Precinct 2. Full disclosure, um, I live right next to Timberneck Swamp, which is that area in green in the center on the left. I was also one of the original uh, petitioners back in January. I did not pack up and leave town. That shows you what I think of the issue. Strongly opposed to the amendment to um, change the distances back or from 1,000 to 500. Or whatever, if you could put them back up, yeah. Yeah, to change it from 1,000 to 500 and 300 to 150. Um, Mr. Leila, sure, I'm sorry about this. Could you put the map back up? <laughs> What that effectively does, following on Mr. Halsey's comments, is to turn Timberneck back to green. And to me, this is a public safety issue, and one of the most uh, prominent or egregious public safety issues here is Timberneck Swamp. My children are some of the mischievous children that Mr. Halsey referenced. They are. And so um, it defeats one of the main purposes, in my opinion, of the proposed revised bylaw, if we would go ahead with this amendment. Uh, understand that some have made the argument that there's been no problem to date. By that same logic, you would not outlaw murder in the town if there had been no murders to date. The logic doesn't make sense. Strongly opposed to this amendment. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Are we, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Pacino. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Phil Pacino, Precinct 5. Um, I also am urging town meeting to uh, vote down the amendment. I'm a little bit surprised that I see one green area is the Reading Municipal Light Building. <laughs> Being a commissioner on that. Um, <laughs> I, maybe we're going to shoot the commissioners, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Please, it's illegal. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think that we need to, you know, I hate to think that we're going to potentially, and God forbid, you know, put any of the employees that work for the light department in jeopardy. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Are we ready for the vote? Oh, Mr. Wells. I have a question for the, uh, excuse me, uh, Carl Weld, Precinct 7. Um, question for uh, the committee. Uh, the Timberneck Swamp property owner, does he open that up to hunting? Mr. Halsey. As of this time, the Timberneck Swamp is open to bow hunting by two people um, with stated permission from the owner, one being himself and one other person. So inside of Timberneck Swamp, um, there is, it's posted as no hunting, which was his original intent, and then he made a decision, as property owners can do, uh, to permit bow hunting, which he specifically detailed, and so bow hunting in Timberneck Swamp is, in fact, in the private property inside of Timberneck Swamp. Um, is in fact allowed to those two people who have permission from the owner. Okay, um, so we have no knowledge of anyone hunting in town with a firearm. My, my point being- well, What is, is your point, Mr. Weld? My point is that even if there was firearms discharge in that area, that they would have been done illegally that would have been true, you know, if, it, if firearms were discharged, and they may well have been, they may not have been. I can't really answer that question. There have been investigations as to certain sounds in that swamp over a period of time, whether those are sounds carrying from 
a location not extremely far away that is perfectly legal to discharge firearms is an open question. Is it fireworks mistaken for uh, firearms? I don't know. Nothing has substantiated in, in Timberneck Swamp that there was nefarious shooting going on, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. I don't know if it happened, and nothing, no one has been charged. Now, by changing the rules to 500, from 500 to 1,000, then from 150 to 300, that of course will not stop anyone who decides to go break the law and shoot either before it's changed or after it's changed. But kind of the point of what happened here, and I think what's really important to understand for all the town meeting members, is that there was an instructional motion that was handed by this body to the Board of Selectmen that said as a result of complaints and concerns about public safety, please examine Timberneck Swamp, please examine in general our policies. Upon review, one of the things we discovered during the last town meeting is that the current bylaw that we had written was written in a highly inappropriate way. Our town council says to us at the time that it was unintelligible. So it needed to be fixed no matter what. So that was part of what the committee was instructed to do by this body. And I think to someone's point here, I think it was done quite simply, quite succinctly and in, in a very understandable way. At the same time, there was a charge to look at for public safety and what made some good common sense, and I think that was done as well. So I hope that answers your questions. If you have more, I'm happy to answer them for you on behalf of the committee. Uh, yeah, that answered my question. Um, I just wish the committee had done it in the least restrictive way possible as opposed to the most restrictive way well, possible. The most can the most would be much larger than that, and of course it isn't the most. The most would have been large enough to eliminate all the green. However, that didn't happen. In, in America, and especially in Reading, what we try to do is compromise points of view to a central place where we can have some understanding of both public safety, common sense, and people's concerns for each other's welfare. And that was what the committee tried to do. And I believe that at, at what you've seen here is really kind of a demonstration of people who start at opposite ends, end up somewhere in the middle for the common good. Let Anything just, else I can answer for you? Let me just um, point out that I agree to a certain extent that it is a safety issue. It has never been a problem before. Meaning and no one has been injured or killed, you're right. To restrict people's use of their property I think needs to be done in the least restrictive way possible. If this is what the body decides is the least restrictive, so be it. And if I could just uh, counter Mr. Mon's point about fireworks, I wish fireworks were less regulated, but that's just me. I saw a hand in the middle here. Hey, do you? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Ian Brown, uh, Precinct 8. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the map on the left, you can still bow hunt snares that uh, I've seen in Bear Meadow, um, hunter's nests in the trees for specifically those uses. Can you not also bow hunt in those same areas regardless of whichever map you use? Me, Iris. Yes, that's correct. This bylaw does not restrict bow hunting or snares or any other kind of uh, hunting. This all has nothing to do with hunting, only has to do with the discharge of firearms. So if you're 
engaged in an activity that does not involve the discharge of firearms, this bylaw does not apply to it. Thank you. And I see Ms. Ms. Phillips, have you had the hand up? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Linda Phillips, Precinct 7. Uh, in several of the comments in the background as to the reason why this study occurred um, are not answered in my mind, and before I vote on this, I'd like a little clarification. The first point was look into how and why the by, by law 8.9 was amended in 2011 and report back. The comment in the in, uh, background information says they discovered it was not well written in 2011. <clears throat> town meeting writes these bylaws with the help of town council and how did that get by if it wasn't well written at the time is my question. No one knows. That's why he's, he's bad lawyer or bad town meeting. Oh, maybe I wasn't at that meeting. Um, the, other, the second point was to investigate the history of Timberneck Swamp. We haven't heard anything about that, the history of it. How it was designated conservation land and how it came to be that the island of private land in the middle existed order. and report point back to order. town. We have a point of order. That was the purpose of the Excuse me, we had a point study. of order. I'm sorry, I didn't know who to. Over here. Point of order, are we discussing? Good, good point. We are discussing the, uh, the change in the Just distances. the amendment? Yes. Yeah. Okay, when you're done with that, I'd like. Okay, we'll get back to that. When Right now, we're still discussing the changes in the, is that what you wanted to talk about? Okay, we, we, okay we'll, we'll come back when we, we eliminate the uh, amendment. Good point, Mr. Um, Federio? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ron Dario, Precinct 6. <clears throat> you know, I, I, in regards to the hunting, uh, I would like, I think, my fellow residents who are hunters and find that this is somehow exclusive and trying to deny the hunting. I, I, I would like to just add that it's not so much, I can say for, in my case, and I would imagine for many other town meeting members, that we're not necessarily, we're not like against hunting. It's just Again, firing off. The same point as last time, we're, we're talking strictly about the amendment right now. The amendment in regards to adding the word hunting? No, the distance. Oh, what, what, yeah. what, what the, is um, the um, distances, the. Um, oh, the distances. The distances. Okay. Yes, right. let's, let's do it in terms of distances. Okay. <laughs> let's do it in terms of distances. Uh, I might be able to handle it. Okay, if we're talking about distances and we're making them greater, okay, are we somehow impinging on their right? But I, I mean, m the feeling is, I think among most of us, is that Reading is, the, the population of Reading is not what it was, say, 50 years ago. And that a lot of the, the state laws, I think, are governing areas that are not, not really geared to uh, a town like Reading that is populated to the point where we don't have that many um, we don't have that many spaces for additional homes so it, it's just to sometimes a law that was made many years ago no longer fits the situation so we have homes surrounding these areas and we have firearms that can go distances even beyond a thousand feet so I, I don't want to brand this against one side against another. I think there are many areas in the state where um, you, the law applies and you can, you know, you can do what you want. Be, but here in Reading, with the new streets that have come in, the number of children around, it just doesn't make sense in this particular instance. Thanks. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. P. 
Peter Kasha, uh, Precinct 3. I'd like to move on a vote. Um, are you opposing the motion, the entire motion, which include on the amendments and the main? Are you talking? On the addition. Just on the amendment? Just on the amendment. Okay, we have a motion to uh, end debate on the uh, proposed amendment. Is there a second? Second. It requires a two thirds vote. Do I have my counters? I do. All those in favor of ending debate on the amendment only, please raise your hand. Uh, excuse me, please rise. Mr. Crook? 18. Excuse me? 18. 18. 27. 25. 26. 26. And those opposed? Three. Three. Two. Two. Zero. Zero. Three. The vote being 106 in the affirmative, 8 in the negative, we have ended debate on the proposed amendment. We will now proceed to a vote on amending, changing, uh, we have the numbers up there? Yes, okay. Everybody clear what we're voting on? We're voting on the proposed amendment. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. We are now back to the uh, main motion. Mr. Sexton, uh, Mr. Sexton, did you have a, an answer to a question that came up earlier? Real quickly, thank you, Mr. Moderator. In regards to the full instructional motion, I reported on um, each bullet point back in April, excluding the last one. That was uh, obviously needed to still be formatted and come back to town meeting. I do not have all that information with me tonight as we weren't going to be discussing it, though. Thank you. And now we had another proposed amendment that I told needed to wait on the aisle. Did you have a proposed amendment as well? That was it. Oh, that was it. Okay. Then we're back to discussing the main motion. Ms. Binder. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, I want to thank the committee for the job. It seems like they've done a very good job taking everyone's um, uh, concerns into account, and, and uh, Mr. Halsby's explanation of where things came from was very helpful. Um, looking at what the previous bylaw is and what the proposed one is, it seems like the arbitrariness of having the selectmen issue permits is gone, and it seems like the um, uh, there now needs to be something written so that if, the, if one of the uh, police officers want to see the written permission, that, that's a um, very positive change. Um, I have a question about uh, the use of such weapons, the very last point. Um, the use of such weapons on any lawfully permitted target trap or skeet range. The old bylaw references hunting, but it also references the MGL Chapter 131 relative to hunting and sporting. And I'm, so the use of such weapons on any lawfully permitted target trap or skeet range was not specifically outlined in the previous bylaw, but it is here. So can you? Tell me what lawfully permitted target trap or skeet range is, or sh it, is it like hunting where it shouldn't be enunciated in the law? I'm not quite sure what that is. How is, what, is, what exactly is a lawfully permitted trap Mr. or a lawfully permitted skeet range? Mr. Meares. Halsey, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Halsey, Precinct 1. So that is a direct reference to there are sport with the use of firearms that include trap, skeet, and so forth. The things that are enunciated there, target shooting, trap shooting, skeet shooting, these are generally understood and accepted sports that occur on legally permitted ranges and we happen to have those here in town 
as a matter of fact, again, you know, the map doesn't show it at the moment, but um, we've had for decades um, uh, actually a very good citizen in the Reading Rifle and Revolver that has, you know, offered youth programs and training and safety, and they do conduct target shooting, trap shooting, skeet shooting, and okay. that's what those are. Because the previous, the, the current bylaw says established rifle range, so I knew that there was an established rifle range, right. but what I was wondering is can anybody set up cans in their yard and shoot no. those, or is, so, 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 so if you if you're within a thousand feet of a structure or within 300, if, if this bylaw passes, those are the new. I mean, you wouldn't be able to do that. Now, um, at the moment, we do have, as I said, you know, there's a there is a Reading Rifle and Revolver range that does all of those things. Right. And if I'm a property owner that meets all the criteria, and I choose to discharge a firearm on my property. Uh, to Mr. Weld's point, I mean, I have the right to do that if I meet all the criteria. And so, yes, I could do all of, any and all of those things okay. if I chose to do that on my property as the property owner, um, provided I meet all the rest of the criteria. Okay, but you 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 can also currently do it too. So certainly. It's, okay. All right. So it's just that bef because right now it just says established range, and then the bylaw says relative to hunting and sporting so well you, you got to remember that I mean that previous bylaw for many reasons you're enunciating one of them um, was very flawed and needed to be changed so okay. so that kind of is going away okay. and you know what we tried to do is clarify all of those things we, we tried to make the obvious more obvious I guess is what okay it is. so the, the the what is allowed really hasn't changed it's just the way it's written out that and now if it passes there will be a a distance restriction but those uses are still permitted as they were before you, you can use your property provided it meets the criteria you know as you've always been able to use your property um, okay. it just the criteria will change to a certain extent if this bylaw passes tonight okay. there'll be fewer places in the town of reading for all the reasons previously mentioned Okay, so so I'm in support of this, but I would um, I don't know if it's appropriate, but I would I would like to hear um, um, Chief Cormier's opinion on this if he cares to um, state anything. Mr. Cormier, but thank you very Happy much. Happy to yield, Chief. <clears throat> thank you. Um, as was mentioned earlier in the uh, minutes of the meetings. If you were to ask me what is the safest thing for the, for the committee to do, it's to eliminate the discharge of firearms in the community. It's common sense. If nobody's shooting guns, nobody's gonna get shot. So that being said, the committee worked really hard at trying to find a compromise as Mr. Halsey spoke about earlier. I am in support of the compromise um, bylaw that's been proposed. I think it's a fair compromise. I think it meets a lot of the concerns that were raised earlier about discharging of firearms and addresses a lot of the issues that were brought up. That's my opinion. Further discussion, Mr. Brown? Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, I know we've heard an awful lot about uh, safety for the guns for the children. It might be of interest to the town meeting to know that back in the early 30s, the town of Reading, in fact, gave rifle training to boys at, and girls at was what is now 75 Longwood Place. So we were teaching kids to shoot. Was there a hand up in the uh, finance committee? Yes. Ann Landry, Precinct 5. Uh, I had a question uh, either for members of the committee or council about whether an owner on private property really um, can't can uh, discharge a firearm without meeting other criteria because um, I'm seeing that the under the discharge is prohibited um, on over or onto any private property except by the owner or legal occupant so it, I'm reading that to mean it's essentially um, almost like a 
fourth authorized discharge. Um, so th I, I would read this to mean that if you're an owner or legal occupant or you have their in consent within a year of that owner, you can discharge a firearm on your property. You don't, and it doesn't matter if it's um, within a thousand feet from a dwelling or not. Mr. Miaris. So now that's actually not correct. The, um, uh, the prohibitions um, in 8.9.1.2 are um, not cumulative. That is to say, you ha you, that if you violate any of these three, it, it is um, prohibited. So, um, start with on, over, or on to street, highway, park, or other public property. Then there's the distances. And then the last is on, over, or onto any private property. And then when there's a carve out for the owner and for somebody who has the permission of the owner. But this does not mean that an owner can be within 1,000 feet of a dwelling or, or within 300 feet. Is that, those distances still apply. Further discussion? Mr. Thank Martin? you. Um, could I? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Um, I was wondering if I might offer an, an amendment in 8.9.1.2. Um, the first uh, description, um, or the first bullet, I, I think the word of might be extraneous. We might not need it. That is a typo. Okay, thanks. Okay, further discussion? Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. I thought I understood this, but n now maybe I don't. Um, it's my understanding that the authorized discharges under 8.9.1.3, including trap shooting, do not have to comply with the restrictions such as a thousand feet so that a permitted target range could be anywhere on that map, just not just in the green area. And I think Mr. Halsley maybe um, misstated or, or I didn't understand what he said. And then a, a follow-up question, how are the skeet ranges or target ranges permitted? Is that by the town or by the state? Mr. Meares? Your understanding is correct, and the answer to the second is that, that those um, uh, shooting ranges are permitted um, um, under state law, but the permits are issued um, by the uh, police department. Further discussion? Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precincts 4. Um, I appreciate Chief Cormier's comments, and while I appreciate the diplomatic statement that this is a fair compromise, I'm mostly struck by his comment that a general ban is common sense. Um, my feeling is that, though, I don't want to lose what we've accomplished with this and go back. If we don't pass this, then we go back to what um, exists, and that's not really a good choice. I'm hopeful, though, that if we pass this tonight, that perhaps the Board of Health that Nancy Doxer is on would consider looking at this as a public health issue and coming back to us at some point in the future within the next year or so with a general ban. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, in the back. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ken Tucci, Precinct 8. I just have a question on the uh, private property component of this. If I'm reading it correctly, the existing bylaw, there's an additional check and balance in the form of the selectman being required to sign off on any permission. And in the new one, it does not have that check and balance. And I'm just wondering why you felt that was um, not needed any longer. Mr. Sexton.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, in regards to the Board of Selectmen having uh, given the permission, the committee basically felt that there was no board that would ever give such permission and that it would be uh, something that's a, maybe putting a restriction on in place that just simply would never happen. Uh, and the, the thought was that that was not what this compromise was looking to do. It was looking to uh, make sure that both safety issues were uh, addressed as well as um, making sure that property owners' rights were kept intact. Further discussion? Ms. Phillips. Uh, yeah, thank you, Linda Phillips, Precinct 7. I do vaguely remember a conversation at April Tom meeting about the history of uh, Timberneck Swamp, but um, how much land actually is the private parcel inside the swamp? Did we have an answer? Oh, Mr. Halsey? 12.3 acres. 12.3 acres, okay, thank you. I, I didn't realize that even in all our conversation. Um, was there ever a conversation or a suggestion uh, for the town to consider the possible purchase of such land by eminent domain to keep the whole parcel conservation land? Mr. Halsey, uh, that is that is be beyond the scope of this article. If if you can give a quick answer, I'll no, it's it, in the background information, and I wanted to know that. Uh, so I the answer to that is, um, first of all, it's private property, and you know that's up to the property owner if that property owner ever wanted to sell. Um, eminent domain was never a discussion, because why would it be? Well, you know, the whole point here was to find a way to protect public safety right. without infringing on the rights of property owners, which, you know, by proposing an eminent domain movement um, for a un, for potentially unwilling seller um, would, be a, would be a gross violation of their property rights. And so therefore, we felt it was outside the purview of discussion. Is that not to say that at some point the town couldn't entertain a discussion with the property owner? Certainly. Um, but that wasn't one of the charges that was um, laid out for the committee, and so we didn't go there. Um, I mean, I, I don't mean to say that in a, in a flippant way. We, you know, we didn't see that as part of the purview of the instructional motion. Well, the, the purpose of the motion, as written here and as I understood at the time, was because of the grave concern of the parents of children living in that area and that this one particular parcel was apparently the cause of discharging of firearms, where the area all around it was restricted because it was conservation land. Well, first of all, there was no demonstration of a discharge of firearms. There was a complaint of such. Right, right. That's number one. Um, number two, you know, the instructional motion that was presented to the, um, to, to the Board of Selectmen was to seek safe alternatives to the current situation. And if you take a look at this bylaw, um, Timberneck Swamp, which was the original 12 plus acres in question, immediately evaporates from legitimate and legal discharge of firearm. So it's the problem, that particular safety problem is solved with the implementation of this bylaw change. I'm confused because people who live in that area say they're not going to support this because it doesn't do what they hoped it would do was to limit the exchange of firearms in that area. I, I you know, I, I actually, I, I can't respond to that because I, I don't know who would have told you that and I haven't heard anyone that lives in this area. Um, I know there are several people that live in this area who are in this room who have so now there's only, excuse me, now there's only bow hunting in the conservation area? There, you, you got to remember something. Hunting is outside of our purview. We well, can't. Well, I know, but there's a concern about, safety concern about firearms. Uh, yes, and effectively the implementation of this bylaw will create the prohibition of the discharge of firearms within boundaries of land that 
today it would be legal and appropriate and once this passes and is signed off by the Attorney General's office, it would then become illegal. So the area of concern that began the concern of the instructional motion mm -hmm. was, not an, was not at issue because firearms was never able to be... I, that is not what I said. What I, what I said was... No, I'm, the, I'm just trying to understand because mm -hmm. I'm hearing conflicting information. Are you okay? Let me let me be clear, and and hope that this is not conflicting for you. There was an instructional motion that was handed along to the board of selectmen that yes. said, effectively, and I'm paraphrasing, that um, it's come to our it's come to the body's attention that there is a potential safety hazard in the Timberneck Swamp. This prompts a discussion about gun safety and firearm safety, and look at it all and see what you can figure out, essentially. I'm, again, right. I'm trying to I simplify it. That. And so the committee did just that. And of course, special attention, but not only attention to the Timberneck Swamp private property um, is kind of how we got where we are right now. I mean, the, that was the prompting um, complaint that caused the instructional motion, which caused the committee to be formed to look at firearm safety in general within the framework I, of the town. I understand that. What I don't understand is, was the Timberneck Conservation Area already exempt from discharging a firearm? The conservation area? Yes. 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 So it was just that 12 acre piece of It was of the island inside the, the conservation ring, yeah. Right, okay. That's what I wanted yep. to know. Um, and the other question here on the background of the purpose of this investigation for the Warren article is investigate the legality of transforming any type of firearm or explosive across town. Is it legal to transport? What was the result of if that? If you're properly licensed, it is legal to transport a firearm across town. If you are properly licensed to possess Owner a, firearm, a firearm, own a firearm, transport a firearm, and in some cases conceal a firearm based on your level of licensing, that law, so I nothing mean, has changed in that Nothing area. has changed in that regard because that is the law, that it's a state law that is then administered at the local level by our local okay. um, police chief and his, and his designees. Okay, what I'm trying to get to is the purpose of all these meetings and all this discussion and all this revision of current firearm law, even though admittedly it wasn't written as well as it should have been, was not to actually make the Timberneck area more safe, because it already is, from firearms discharge, but to restrict the access of private property owners to go from 300 feet uh, to 1,000 feet, and from 150 feet to 300 feet. That would not be correct in my, in my analysis of what the committee did. I, I don't think that's a proper evaluation of what they looked at. There was a holistic look at firearm safety and where you could legally discharge a firearm throughout the town of Reading. And we felt that that was what the charge was, is to look at this prompted by one location and in a holistic way to look at the general safety of the population throughout, throughout the confines of Reading. So to, to say that somehow there wasn't attention paid or there was never a problem to begin with in Timberneck Swamp is, I, I think, not an accurate description of what went on either from the instructional motion or by the committee. But that's the fact, sir, that there was nothing going on. I disagree with you, and of course, because it's verify. America, we're allowed to disagree about right. the analysis but of what happened. We can't disagree about the actual facts. Oh, I, but the analysis of the facts, we most certainly can, and we do. I don't support this article. I think it's unreasonable under the circumstances for an instructional motion to drastically change the personal rights of firearm owners, of which I am not. And as an owner of chickens, I would have to call someone to help me get rid of any coyotes were my chickens in trouble. You could call me because I am a registered firearm <laughs> owner. And I do hunt and have since I've been eight years old. So, you know, the idea But I of, think by the time you got there, it would be too late. Yeah. I'm voting against this article. Thank you. 
Go to the discussion. Ms. Russell. Peg Russell, Precinct 3. I move the question. Okay, question. Uh, there's a motion to move the question. And uh, is there a second? Second. This would end debate if it passes. It requires a two-thirds vote. I would ask the same counters. Uh, all those in favor of ending debate on the entire motion, please rise. Mr. Crook? 19. 19. Mr. Brown? 28. 28. Ms. Russell? 37. 37. Mr. Rushworth? 28. 28. Those opposed? Oh, oh, sorry. What? Uh, Ms. Russell, could you say your number again? No, on, on the, uh, in favor? 38. 38. Okay. Those opposed? One. 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 Two. Sorry, two. two. Uh, start over again. Mr. Crook? One. Mr. Brown? Two. Two. Mr. Rushworth? Ms. Russell? Zero. The vote being 112 in the affirmative, five in the negative. The question has been moved. Debate is stopped, and we will now proceed to a vote on the main motion. Uh, all those in favor of the main motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Mr. Mon, did you have a, an instructional motion to make or not? You did not. Okay, Mr. Ensminger. Uh, oh, personal privilege, sure. I didn't want to let this occasion pass without uh, thanking someone in our midst who has served the town very well for 30 years and for whom this is probably his last town meeting. That would be Chief Jim Cormier, who will be retiring at the end of the year. And while you're up at the mic, you want to say? <laughs> Move that this town meeting stand adjourned, signed he die. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. This town meeting stands adjourned, signed he die.